The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to him Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were all terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. You, you may be seated. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, it is Transfiguration Sunday. This is the Sunday that shows up every year in the church calendar, the Sunday between the end of the season of Epiphany and the beginning of the season of Lent. Every year we journey up the mountain with Jesus, we are blinded along with his disciples. We listen in on their panic. They're offered to build little altars. Then we journey back down with them, down the mountain, with Jesus, into his life and his ministry. So this morning, I want to offer three illustrations, three brief stories about this text to get you into this text in three different ways. You can pick the story that resonates the most with you. Here are the three stories. Several summers ago, several summers, I worked at a summer camp in Colorado. The base camp was at about 10,000 feet, and to get to the base camp, we would need to cross a high mountain pass. As luck would have it, one day when we crossed this high pass, me, I was driving a large camp van. I was so blinded by the early morning light that I could literally see nothing. How do I drive, I asked my passenger, who was another camp counselor. I could not see the edge of the road. I could not see the mountain. I could not see anything. Just stop, he told me. We quickly cleaned all the windows, but to no avail. The light was so brilliant that we just couldn't see. It was so brilliant, in fact, that I felt nauseous. But we found a way through. We both rolled down our windows, and now each of us, with a head hanging out the side of the road, could see enough of the road that we could drive until the trees blocked the sunlight. I have since learned to carry sunglasses and to keep a clean windshield, but that morning, the light was simply terrifying. There was too much of it, too much radiance. And if you have driven into morning sun, you have probably felt that as well. Too much radiance. It causes you to panic. And that's how our text describes the transfiguration, that the clothing of Jesus was pulsing with light, so bright, brighter than anything that anyone could bleach. It's the same word to describe the light at the very beginning of creation and the same word to describe the light that bounced off the face of Moses. Brilliant, powerful, blinding light. It would make our morning light look tame. So I get why the disciples were terrified. It was too much. The radiance of God was too much for them, and they couldn't see anything else. Many of us long for a transfiguration moment in our life, something defining. If only God would send me a sign, tell me the right thing to do, tell me the right decision to make. If only I could be sure it was God, then it would be enough then I would know what to do about this job or my family or this decision or this health crisis if only God would send me a sign. But perhaps, dear ones, the transfiguration story shows us that the radiance of God is simply too much. 
It is too much for us. We cannot stand in the presence of God without utter disorientation. So perhaps God to, comes to us more subtly. Perhaps God comes into our life more quietly. Which brings me to my second story. Every year when this transfiguration text rolls around, I think of one of my seminary professors and her cat. She tells the story that she, as a single woman, had really deep love for her cat, and it was true. We heard about that cat all the time. One day, when she got home from work, she realized that the door to her apartment had somehow come open during the day, and her cat was missing. She was heartbroken. She searched the whole apartment, every nook and cranny. Then she searched the shared yard, talked with her neighbors, called the cat for hours. After doing all that she could to find her cat, defeated, she leaned against her refrigerator to cry. She loved this cat, this curious cat, who was probably now gone forever. And as the sobs moved through her, she suddenly felt a pressure on her shoulders, a familiar pressure. It was her cat who had watched the entire search from the top of the refrigerator. <laughs> he was in sight the whole time, she told us. I just didn't know where to look. And I don't wonder if that tells us something about the transfiguration. He was in sight the whole time. I just didn't know where to look. Could it be that God's glory is all around us, all the time, in plain sight, but we just don't know how to notice it. We can't stand the dazzling light, so God takes it down a notch for us. But it is still there, shimmering through our lives every day, shimmering through your life. It is right there in front of us, watching from atop the refrigerator. The glory of God, the presence of God is right there. But we don't know where to look, and we don't know how to look. Which brings me to my third story. Many of you have been attending one of our Epiphany, Epiphany series classes this winter. One is on the context of 1 Corinthians, which is utterly fascinating. Amen? Amen. Amen. And one is on the idea of modern mysticism, or God's presence in our everyday life. I have been going to both classes, 30 minutes in each, and I have been fascinated. When I say that we have an abundance of riches here at Zion, I am not joking. Make a commitment to learning, my friends, because you will not regret it. But there was a question in one of those classes that struck me. After talking for several weeks about mysticism and God's presence in our days, Jessica, who was teaching that class, asked the class how homework had gone that week. The homework, she reminded us, was to do some type of spiritual practice, some type of shifting in our awareness, in our awareness so that we would be aware of the presence of God. Maybe a walk, maybe meditation. She gave us a list of very easy things. Well, the room went quiet. I went quiet. I thought about my last seven days. Now, the thing is, as your pastor, my work is explicitly about faith. Writing sermons feels deeply spiritual to me. Meeting with you to talk about your lives feels abundantly holy. Leading chapel or confirmation or class or worship feels so sacred. Even writing the newsletter or the more mundane parts of my work, most of it feels very tied to how I understand God's call in the world. But as I reviewed my last seven days in that class, I realized I had not done any of those small practices of faith. I hadn't noticed God in my daily life. Martha Graham, the great dancer, once said, the definition of love is paying attention. Paying attention. Being present. Letting the radiance of God creep into your days. Noticing it when it does. Trusting that it will. It will, friends. It will. Because that is who God is. God is radiant. See, we could talk about mysticism all day, we could study the ancient mystics, we could learn definitions, but until we practice the presence of God, it only lives in our heads. And as Lutherans, we like our heads. And that is where I think God is inviting us this Transfiguration Sunday. 
See, the light is too bright. It is too brilliant. It is too much. For God to appear in God's full glory, who could bear it? Even Peter, rock of the church, was terrified, overcome, overwhelmed. And I think God is kinder than that. I think that in God's kindness, God is subtle. So what if the invitation is not to be overwhelmed with glory, but to notice the presence of God already among us? Remember the cat on the fridge there in plain sight all along? God among us, here in plain sight, the radiance of God all around us. Irenaeus, a second century bishop, said the glory of God is the human being fully alive. The glory of God is the human being fully alive. The radiance of God is alive in you. But to pause and to notice, that's the work. That is the invitation. Yes, because your neighbor needs it. You hear me say that every week, that God gifts us so that we can serve our neighbors. But also, because it is simply God's gift to you. The radiance of God, the glory of God, right in front of us, right within us, within us that is God's gift to you. So pause, my friends. Bring your attention here. Notice here. Not critically, but with an open heart. As the light streams through the stained glass, God is here. As your eyes are drawn to art, God is here. As your fingers touch the baptismal water, this morning, God is here. As your hands curl around the bread and wine, God is here. As you share peace, touching your neighbor, God is here. As you raise your voice in song this morning, God is here. You are in the presence of God, in this moment and in all moments. So let us say thanks be to God. Amen.